So I think I'm just going to start us off now because it seems like we've got quite a few people. Um, so welcome to our uh, fall 2020 staff picks live event. Um, just to start off, uh, the idea for this came from the staff picks video that we usually do every year. Um, we usually film that in the office uh, for each season of books, um, of which we have two per year. Um, and it's usually staff members just talking about their favorite book from the season or one of their favorite books from the season. Um, it's pretty quick um, and very kind of like rigidly filmed and produced. Um, and obviously because we're not in the office this year and things are a bit different, we still wanted to do something. And so we turned that little video that we made into this kind of much bigger event um, where you get to kind of like meet a bunch of staff members um, and also hear them talk about uh, the books that we love so much. So the season that we're talking about in this event is the fall 2020 season. Um, so I'm just gonna put the link to the fall 2020 catalog in the chat. Um, if you wanna take a look at some of the books that we'll be covering today, it's all of those books. Um, and uh, just a little bit of etiquette. I'm sure a lot of you know this already, but yeah, during um, any sort of events like this, it's great if you can keep your camera off and your microphone off uh, if you're not talking. Um, and we'll also be doing that to respect each other during the presentation. Um, and if you have any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat. We will be answering questions at the end. So if you could save your questions for the end, that would be great. Um, and if you have any like reactions to the books or to the titles or anything, like feel free to pop some notes in the chat. Um, if you want to connect with anyone, that's the best way to do it. Um, and uh, yeah, also feel free to add uh, the Zoom reactions because yeah, we want to see if you're excited for books. Um, so yeah, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna kick it right off um, with Judy and her uh, book for this presentation. So take it away, Judy. Hi folks, uh, I'm Judy Brunswick. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing here at Owl Kids Books. And one of my favorite, favorite books of this fall season is this one here, The Paper Boat. It is an amazing book. Um, I'm lucky enough to be able to see books uh, well in advance of publication. And I have to tell you that the first time I saw the rough pages for this, I cried because it is such a wonderful personal story. I'm gonna get all verklempt now doing this. Um, anyway, but it is, it's a wonderful, very personal story about Ta by, Ta by Tao Lam about her own family's uh, departure from Vietnam and, and, and becoming refugees ultimately in Canada. Um, Tao Lam is an amazing visual storyteller. Um, as you'll know from her backlist, books like My Cat Looks Like My Dad, Wallpaper, those kinds of, uh, um, and A Skunk on a String. All of them have been award, uh, have been nominated or uh, um, given special accolades. One of the things that Tao really does super well is explore the whole theme of identity. And in this case, because she uses her own family, it's, it's such a personal story. One of the things that I love about the book is the pacing. Uh, it is a wordless picture book too. So um, that's really interesting. And, and the pacing and the way that Tao uses the various panels in the book, let's see if I can find a page that has panels, um, and uh, is able to weave in, there, does that work? I don't know, let's see. Uh, able to weave in both reality and metaphor in this, in telling the story of, the, of her family's departure from Vietnam when she was just a young child. Um, she uses her own mother's story about, uh, about ants and how ants play a role and those ants play a metaphorical role in the, <clears throat> in the book. And um, you really come to understand the, perilous journey that refugees take um, and uh, but it's not told in a scary way for kids it's very accessible for kids because there's so much um, visual richness in there and what you really get a sense of is the determination the resilience the optimism and the hope that it takes to leave one country and come to and, and move to another one often with very little or just leaving behind lots of family members I'm making it sound like a real downer, but the thing about this book is that it is really optimistic and, and it does, and I think one of the things that I love is at the end, and I'm gonna try this again, is you see Tao and her family, which now has four, because it started off with three, her mother was pregnant when the journey started, um, in a big city cityscape with families of all kinds shown in the, through the windows of this apartment building. Um, the other thing I love about the book is uh, that not a single inch of space is wasted, right from the end papers through to 
even the title page, there is storytelling happening all over the place. And that's why I think, um, that's one of the things that I think is really brilliant about how uh, Tao um, puts her books together and is, and is very thoughtful about them. The other thing is this is able, because it's a wordless picture book, it gives you a chance to explore the ideas with children and it really can start a conversation. We've produced a video where Tao talks about her inspiration and some of the facts behind the book. We've got discussion guides, all of that sort of thing. So if you are a teacher or a librarian, you can head to our website, owlkidsbooks.com and find that there. Anyway, I love this book. I love all the books. I know there are a bunch of creators on this call, so I would love all the books, trust me. Um, but I do love this one because it is such a powerful story of, um, of a one refugee family, but that it feels very universal to many. With that, I am going to pass it off to Melissa. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Melissa. I'm the editor of Owl Magazine. And my favorite book from the fall 2020 L Kids list is My Wild Life by Susie Esterhaus. Um, I really love this book because it's not only gorgeous, I mean, there's so many stunning photos inside the book, but also it's that rare look at the behind the scenes of what it takes to be a wildlife photographer. And uh, there's a lot of things that I didn't expect <laughs> um, to learn when I read this book. I mean, you don't really think about the logistics of it all, but it's quite interesting. Um, for instance, there's a lot of waiting around, obviously, in nature, waiting for animals to appear. And um, Susie talks about things like everybody, the call of nature, everybody has to go. So she has to have a pee bottle with her while she's waiting for animals to appear in the wild and just things like that I found really interesting that we don't really think about. Um, what I also liked about it is it's, it is accessible to kids, you know, obviously kids aren't going to be um, traveling to on safari or things like that. Um, maybe some will, but not, not me anyway, not in my childhood. Um, but she gives you tidbits of how to make your own photography, create your own photography in your own backyard. So there's lots of photography tips embedded within for kids, which is really nice. Um, I also just love the fact that she talks about so many different places that she's been to in the world. Um, there, it, it's great, like all the continents that she's vis visited are, are covered in this book. So that's really nice. And it, it's also inspirational because she does talk about how when she was a little girl, um, she wanted to be a photographer and her, she wanted to be a wildlife photographer specifically and travel the world and her parents really encouraged her. And she started by just taking pictures at the zoo and, and sanctuaries and things like that. And I thought that was really cool. It's a great message for, for especially owl readers. Um, we actually featured this book in one of the magazines. So I'm excited about that as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I am excited about this book and I, I, um, I think a lot of kids will enjoy it. And uh, I'll, oh, I'll share my favorite spread with you as well. Kind of speaks for itself. Mothers and babies. <laughs> Enough said. Um, that was one of my favorite spreads in the book. Just really cute. And with that, I will pass it on to Jackie. Hi everyone, I'm Jackie, editor of Chirp Magazine, and my favorite book from the 2020 fall list is Cone Cat by Sarah Howden and illustrated by Carmen Mock. This book is hilarious and silly and cute, and it's about a cat named Jeremy who is very mischievous. This is one of the spreads of him getting up to all craziness, who wakes up one day and has a cone on his neck and it really starts to hinder his mischievousness. So the book is just all about him exploring his new life with the cone, and at first he really doesn't like it, and then he starts to embrace it and realizes that the cone is actually good for a lot of things, like maybe getting some extra treats poured into it by accident when someone thinks it's a cereal bowl or <laughs> things like that. So I just thought this book was so cute, and a really great way, especially now, for kids to think about embracing change. And reading this with my son last week, I just felt it resonated so much with him and with me for this time. And thinking about the ways that new situations can be scary and weird and confusing, but how you can actually look for the good and often find the good in them. So I loved it. Over to you, Ange. Thanks, Jackie. 
My name's Angela Keenleyside. I'm the publisher of uh, Chirp, Chickadee, and Owl magazines. And my favorite book on the fall 2020 list is Raja's Rule for the Bathroom at School. It's written by Lana Button and illustrated by Hatim Ali. I love this book so much. Uh, it's a story of a little boy who has some pretty serious anxiety about using the washroom at school. Um, the book does an amazing job of showing the readers uh, how he overcomes this uh, fear uh, through the story. There are so many reasons why I love this book. I mean, you can see the illustrations are super cute. The writing is fun and funny. Um, show you a spread here. Lots of action and just a joy to, to read. Um, Raj has a lot of rules to keep from having to use the washroom, such as don't drink any water, don't go near water, don't sneeze, don't laugh. Um, just amazing. Another reason I really love this book is as a parent, it just rings very true. When I would uh, pick up my son from JK, all the parents would be standing around and there'd be many questions they'd be asking each other. Will my child have eaten their lunch? Will my child be coming out of school wearing the same clothes that my child went into the school wearing? And has my child used the washroom? And it's hard to remember now uh, as an adult because <laughs> as you get older, it seems impossible that kids actually can hold it for an entire school day. So it is actually something that happens all the time. So it's great to have a book that you can share with children who might have um, be struggling with that issue. Um, and also, as Jackie mentioned, in terms of Cone Cat, um, there's a lot of anxiety for kids right now generally going back to school. And I think no matter what that anxiety might be rooted in right now, that having a book to share with kids that shows a child overcoming this anxiety and the joy at the end once they have overcome their fear is really important. So I would encourage everybody to check this book out. So thank you and I will pass this over now to John. Really? I thought I was after Ella, I must have been reading an old list. Okay, anyway, <laughs> I may not know who's after me then either, but anyway, I'm John Crossingham. I'm the uh, senior writer for um, OWL Magazine and the OWL Connected website. And my favorite book that I would like to share with you from this list is Maurice and His Dictionary, which is written by Carrie Fagan and Enzo, uh, illustrated, sorry, by Enzo Lord Mariano. Uh, so this is a book um, about a, a Jewish family who's uh, living in Belgium uh, at the time of the outbreak of the Second World War, and uh, it's the story of how they uh, have to flee first through France, uh, and then eventually through Portugal, and then uh, taking a boat uh, along with other refugees to Jamaica to try and start a, a new life. Um, before I was the senior writer, I was actually the senior editor in the book department for quite some time. And uh, I was a little drawn to this book because I had edited this book in the past, The Last Train by Rona Arado, which was also uh, about um, the experience of Jews during uh, World War II and the Holocaust. The interesting thing about Maurice and his dictionary is that um, it looks at a more of an under-examined side of what uh, Jewish people had to go through during this time in that uh, it wasn't about uh, families who um, were sent to one of the many camps. Uh, instead, they managed to avoid them, but still had to deal with an immense amount of struggle and prejudice. Uh, had to uh, make new homes time and again, and even had to experience uh, when they reached the camp in uh, Jamaica, even though they're sort of free, they're still held behind uh, fences and barbed wire, and they still have a very regimented existence. They don't have a lot of freedoms, and there's still a great challenge to try and establish a sense of themselves and a sense of. Um, self-determination over what their life can be and um, I think you know it's important to understand that um, not all of these experiences were about sort of 
necessarily the worst extremes, that there are many colors to what refugees have to go through, uh, and uh, all of them have their own struggle uh, to them. Uh, eventually, um, uh, actually, well, I didn't mention that the Maurice in the story is Carrie Fagan's father, so the author's father. So eventually, um, Maurice uh, uses his own sense of determination and strong will and the support of his family to find a way to realize his dream of becoming a lawyer. And um, he eventually comes here uh, and settles in Toronto and starts a practice and a family. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, it's just, it's a really well-told story. It's a graphic novel, sort of a picture book, graphic novel hybrid. Um, and it's lengthy and thorough, but also it really, really moves. And it's uh, a wonderful read, beautifully illustrated. And um, yeah, I just, I just found it's a testament, I think. One of the things we struggled with when telling this story was how do you tell another story about the experience of Jews in the Holocaust that doesn't feel like a story that's already been told. And uh, I think that this is a really great addition to that canon of showing that you never really run out of unique stories to tell about this time in history. Uh, there's no end of lessons to learn from it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's just really, really beautifully done. And, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that uh, Al was able to put it out. Definitely worth being told. And now, like I said, I thought Emma was after me. Maybe she still is. Or maybe I can just choose someone at random. <laughs> I think it might be me. Is that okay, right? Okay, that sounds good. <laughs> um, okay. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name's Allison. I'm the marketing manager at Owl Kids Books. I know many of you. It's so nice to see you as black squares on our screen today. I hope you're well. Um, one of the books I'm really excited about for fall is called I Do Not Like Stories. This is a picture book by Andrew Larson, illustrated by Carrie Sokochip. Um, probably everyone on this call does like stories, but if you can think about those kids in your life who are convinced they just do not like stories or something at all, um, that's what this book is about. So it follows a little boy who does not like stories about anything. He does not like stories about boring old buildings or, or fish in the sea or pears and plums, nothing. He's not into it. Um, and all day we see him going about his day. He's a little bit grumpy. And the only thing that he really loves, the only thing that he's really thinking about is his cat. He loves his cat so much. Um, I showed you my favorite spread where even at school, like all he wants to do is just draw his cat. He's so focused there with his little tongue sticking out. Um, but the interesting thing is all along the story as we go, you see the cat having a little side narrative following all these things through the town that are yellow, like the color of the boy's backpack. So all day the boy misses the cat, and the cat misses the boy. And at the end, the boy concedes, he actually might like a story if it was about the right thing. And he asks, do you know any stories? Like, do you know any stories about a cat? Um, because that's truly what he wants to hear. And in fact, that's the story that we've been, we've been reading all along. So I love that this is a little bit playful, a little bit sort of tricky, a little bit of a circular narrative but it also really speaks, I think, to kids who are convinced they don't like reading. Um, one detail that I love about this book, and it's actually in the dedication, is that it was based on um, an author visit that the author did with the school for a previous book, and a boy named Henry P, there he is on the dedication page, um, said to the author, Andrew, I do not like stories. He was not interested in hearing anything that Andrew had to say. Um, and many years later, Andrew wrote this book um, sort of as a, as a testament to that kid. And he mentioned on a call with us recently that he went to go drop off a copy of the book for the kid. Um, the kid is now, I think, maybe a teenager. And the, he, he still was not, not even interested. He was just like playing hockey in his yard. And Andrew sort of joked with us, you know, the kid also doesn't like it when authors stop by his yard. So maybe he's just still a contrary kind of boy, but he inspired this adorable book. So um, also I wanted to share that I'm wearing my striped t-shirt in honor of the boy from the book. There it is. So um, congratulations. It's awesome. And I hope you can all check it out this fall. 
And I'm gonna pass it over now to Miriam. Thanks so much, Allison. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Miriam. I'm the editorial assistant for Owl Kids Magazines. Um, and my favorite book from the fall 2020 list is Sometimes a Wall um, by Diane White and illustrated by Beryl. <laughs> um, and basically, I really love this book because it's um, a very simple story. Um, it kind of has very simple words um, to kind of, you know, get the story to kind of progress. And it's all about walls. <laughs> um, there's different kinds of walls that we see. We see like the splash wall, and then there's like a rock climbing wall um, that kids are climbing on. Um, and basically it's, you know, there's, there's a kid who builds a wall to kind of keep everyone out, which is not very nice. Um, you know, you see the kind of simple words here. <laughs> um, and I guess it's, it's basically just, um, you know, a very, very kind of simple story about um, kind of being very nice to people and, you know, being, being kind to everyone and making sure that you're being inclusive because um, even walls that you that are not physical can make someone feel isolated and that's not very nice. Um, so I think it's it's very uh, like a very simple story that kids will enjoy and kind of um, really kind of get, it gets the message across and and yeah I think uh, you know a, a kind gesture can go a long way for someone so yeah I think that's that's the message that Diane was trying to get across <laughs> and I think I'm handing it off to Danielle now. Hi everyone um, my name is Danielle I'm the sales and circulation assistant here at Owl Kids um, and today I'm going to be talking about one of my favorite books for the fall list um, Alice and Gert by Helene Becker and Dina Sieferling um, Alice and Gert is about um, a little ant named Alice and a grasshopper named Gert. Um, and it's based on the classic fable, um, the classic ant and grasshopper fable. Um, so basically, um, it's the middle of, in this book, it's the middle of summer. Um, Alice is hard at work preparing for winter and um, preparing for winter, so gathering food and supplies so that she's all set to go for the winter. Um, but Gert isn't really interested in that at all. She wants to have fun and play, so she spends her days um, dancing and singing, making art, um, and also doing some really um, just entertaining um, Alice as she works. Um, but then suddenly when fall, um, when fall comes, um, a lot faster than Gert anticipates, she realizes that she's not ready for winter. She has no food, she has no supplies. Um, and Alice, um, recognizing that um, Gert has really entertained her and lightened her load throughout her time preparing for the winter, um, offers to share her food with uh, Gert for the season and so they can spend their winter together. Um, I love this book so much. Um, honestly, uh, I'm always, I've always been really drawn to any stories that are based in fables or folklore, so this is right up my alley. Um, one thing I love about this book is just the focus it has on friendship and kindness and um, valuing all different kinds of hard work um, and all different uh, points of view and inputs. Um, not only is, you know, Alice's um, hard work in preparing and gathering food and harvesting food for the winter valued, but so is Gert's um, Gert's um, artistic uh, contributions. Um, I also just love um, how much you can tell each of the characters really care about each other. Um, you can see um, how much uh, Alice especially just is, really cares and is worried about um, Gert um, throughout the book. Um, I have a few uh, specific moments in the book that I really love, um, just in terms of specifically what um, Gert does to entertain Alice as they work. Um, a favorite of mine is um, when she tries to get Alice involved in her pirate play, and Gert or Alice is just isn't really uh, interested at all, but she gets very into the play, and I love it. Um, the other thing that I really love is when um, the leaves start to fall and uh, Alice um, is 
sad that winter is coming. Um, but Gert decides to dance for her and she calls it the dance of the dying spark. Um, and I just really love the imagery that that um, evokes um, with falling leaves and everything. So I love that. Um, and the other thing that I love about this book is just um, the illustrations in general. Uh, Dina has made these gorgeous graphite illustrations um, that I think are just beautiful. Um, and they find them really kind of soothing and mesmerizing as well. Um, but I just, I adore her artwork. Um, so I really, I think this book is really great for fall, um, especially since it's about harvesting and get preparing for winter. Um, so I really hope you guys enjoy it. Um, and I think I'm passing it on to Ella next. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Ella, and I'm the Rights and Editorial Assistant at Owl Kids. Um, and one of my favorite books from the fall 2020 season is Farm Crimes, Cracking the Case of the Missing Egg by Sandra Dumay. Hi, Sandra. Um, so the story opens on a beautiful, quiet morning at the farm, and it's very quickly disturbed by a blood-curdling scream from the barn. Hen's egg has gone missing. Um, Quickly, the animals know exactly what to do. Um, there is only one person to call, and that is the uh, sleuth detective, William Van Hoof, who, believe it or not, is the world's greatest goat detective. More believably, also the world's only goat detective. Um, and hilarity ensues as William takes us on a wild goose chase throughout the farm, looking for clues um, to crack this grueling mystery. Um, of who done it. Um, I love this story. I can't tell you how many times I've read it, but there is something new that I find every single time. Um, I will show you one of the little details that took me a long time to find, um, but the characters are just hilarious, you can see. Um, and here is Hen, and here are Hen's little bunny rabbit slippers who have expressions of their own, um, and they go on their own sort of emotionally um, tumultuous journey <laughs> throughout the entire story. Um, every character is so different, but just like perfect. Sheep is always knitting. Um, uh, pig plays his guitar. The raccoon is always digging through garbage cans, as raccoons do for food, um, and searching for clues. Um, but uh, every time I return to it, there is something that makes me smile or laugh out loud or both. Um, and um, it's, it's just such a heartwarming, hilarious story with so many characters to love. Um, and uh, with that, I am going to pass it on to Taylor. Hi everyone, I'm Taylor and I'm the publicity assistant for All Kids Books. And one of my favorite books for fall is The Egg by Geraldo Valerio. Geraldo, I think you're here, so hello. <laughs> Um, and this is a really great book. It's really a celebration of families and all the different kinds of forms that families can come in. Um, and it's illustrated in Geraldo's amazing collage art. I don't know if you can see, you can see the texture of the paper and the lines and shapes are so expressive. It's just really great. One of the reasons why I love this book so much. Um, but in the book, a bird, this bird on the cover, um, it loses its egg in a storm. And while it's searching, it doesn't find its own egg, but it does find another egg all alone and decides to take that egg in for its own. Um, when the egg hatches, it is not, in fact, another bird, but the bird still loves its new baby all the same. And one of my favorite spreads from the book, it's towards the end, you can see the bird and its new baby and a bunch of other parent and child pairs. There's birds with human babies, there's birds with bird children, cat children, all different sorts of families, but they're all happy to be part of the family that they're a part of. Um, and it's really sweet, it makes you feel good to read, it's very heartwarming, um, but it also could start conversations. It could start a conversation about your own family or about the different kinds of families that are out there, or about things like adoption or foster parenting. Um, so it's a really broad book, um, and it is a wordless story, so it can be open to interpretation, and it could also be open to any family that reads it with their own young ones. Um, but yeah, I really love this book. It's very sweet, and it published in August, so it's out now. If you would like to get a copy, I would recommend it. 
Um, and that's the egg. And with that, I think I'm passing it to Emma. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Emma. I'm the digital marketing assistant for Al Kids Books and Magazines. Um, one of my favorite books from the fall 2020 season is Pretty Tricky by Etta Kaner and illustrated by Ashley Barron. I think both of you are here, so hello. I'm so happy and excited to be presenting this book. Um, I love plants. I don't know if you can see, but I have like a little tiny plant area here with some succulents, and this book just goes right up there with them. Um, it's all about the sneaky and clever ways that uh, plants save themselves uh, from predators, spread their seeds, um, and sort of deal with the challenges of being plants. Um, one of my favorite parts of this book is the discussion about the Venus flytrap. I don't know if you can see here. Um, when I was a little kid, I had a Venus flytrap and I was so excited to feed all of the dead flies in my apartment to this plant, <laughs> um, which is disgusting, but also as a kid, like super fun and really scientific. So I, yeah, I really love this book. Um, Ashley's art, as always, is just gorgeous, just absolutely fantastic. Um, the cut paper collages are just beautiful and vibrant um, and it looks good on any bookshelf. Um, and obviously, Etta being just the, the plant queen, um, knowing so much about, about science and plants, um, like has a bunch of great information here. It's easy to read. It's fun to read. I would say for pretty much all ages, like e even as an adult, I, I love going back to this book and learning new things. Um, and yeah, just fantastic book all around. Um, and with that, I'm going to pass this on to Mandy. Hi there. Um, I'm Mandy. I'm the editor of Chickity Magazine, and my book is uh, Do Lizards Eat Ice Cream? How Animals Beat the Heat, and this is also by Etta Kaner and illustrated by Jenna Pichota. And this is a really fun book um, that talks about different ways that animals use their biology to stay cool in hot weather. Um, so this book is written in a question and answer format. Um, it's super enjoyable for kids. I read it with my kids. Um, and I love the questions because they relate to a lot of human scenarios that are easy for kids to understand. So for example, like uh, the title is Do Lizards Eat Ice Cream? Spoiler alert, they do not. Um, but they do dance. Um, they do like a kind of like a dance on the desert so that they lift their feet up. Um, I just did a dance for you. Um, uh, do frogs use sunscreen to protect their skin? Yes, it comes out of their glands. Super interesting. Um, and my kids love this one. Do squirrels carry umbrellas? They were like, no. And it's like, yes, they actually do. They have these huge bushy tails and it goes like right over their heads. Super cool. So I love these books. They're really fun to read out loud. Um, like I said, I read it with my kids and I'd read it out loud and my kids would go, yes, no. And one of them was sort of, which they also loved. Um, so it's really fun to read again and again. And um, I love it. I think we also had a kid review it in Chickadee um, and he loved it too. So I learned so much from this book. Kids will learn so much from this book it's amazing go get it thank you <laughs> um, and with that I'm passing it over to Caroline thanks Mandy I gotta get that book too um, I'm Caroline uh, I'm the associate art director on Chickadee um, and my favorite book from the Owl Kids fall 2020 list is Poppy and Sam and the search for sleep um, this story is really cute about Poppy and Sam getting ready for the winter to hibernate and Poppy's a girl so she doesn't really hibernate so she um, is frustrated because she can't fall asleep so uh, her and Sam go on an adventure to um, to uh, see some other animals and creatures um, and see what they do to fall asleep um, and this is a very hot topic in my household as well with my two young girls um, who often can't fall asleep because there's a lot of stuff going on in the world lately so there's a lot of sleep issues so this was a real hit with them um uh, and they liked the clever ways that some of the animals suggested like why don't you try some um fly milk was the, what the frog said and they had a laugh with that um i really liked um the format of the story kind of the um intro to uh, a graphic novel um my kids 
followed it al along really well with it. The colors and illustrations were wonderful. Um, overall, just a really great book, super enjoyable, and, um, and really liked it. And that's it. Okay, so um, now I'm gonna pass it off to Judy again, um, who is gonna go over some of the books that we are releasing in different formats like paperback uh, this season. So take it away, Judy. Hi again. Um, so we do, uh, you will have noticed when everybody was holding up their books that they're all hardcovers, but um, books have life in different formats and paperback is one of them. And one of the benefits of paperback books is that they are um, a, a, a lower price and um, are av available and they're lighter to ship too. That's a whole other thing, but um, which is good for online sales. But uh, anyway, I'm going to go through five of our uh, paperbacks that we're publishing this fall. The first one is uh, And an Upshook Means Welcome by uh, Mary Wallace. And this is a lovely picture book acrostic, um, which is basically, it spells out, it uses the letters of Inukshuk um, to tell you different things. And so you'll see really, so very simple. There's the letter I and there's an Inukshuk. And then the next spread has this beautiful artwork and um, the word in um, uh, pronounced in the way it should be pronounced and also in Inuktitut. Um, so it's a lovely kind of tribute to the North, um, done by Mary Wallace, who um, is um, is not Inuit, but uh, who spent a long time uh, in the North and has a great appreciation for the people of the North and the, and the land of the North. And one of the things that's really great is that um, an Inukshuk is singular, Inuksuit um, is the plural, and Inuktitut is the language. Um, but at the end, you can see a bunch of different wayfinders and that's what Inukshuk are individually or Inukshuit are together. So that's that one. The Potato King, Christoph Neiman. I love this book for a number of reasons. One, the whole thing is illustrated in potato cut art, which is kind of brilliant because it's such a great inspiration for kids. And I feel like in a way, it's a, it's a, it's a book about um, using uh, reverse psychology to help sell something. Um, and here we go. If we look at the end papers, we see here King Fritz, who is the king who decided to import potatoes to his country in Europe and had to use a bit of reverse psychology to get um, his subjects to adapt the potato. I don't know what I would have done. I, my family's from Europe, and I got to tell you, there ain't a potato I don't love. Um, but anyway, so I'm glad that uh, Fritz did whatever he did. And then at the end, you can see that, that Fritz is rolling down the potato to his subject. So basically, it's a really fun story, potato cut art, um, and based uh, on a, a, what, is, what is considered to be a legend, but people still actually put potatoes on King Fritz's grave in Europe. So King Fritz was a real, was a, was a real king. So that's fun. You heard about... Uh, Susie Esterhaus earlier, Melissa talking about my wild life. Well, Moto and me, I mean, come on, come on, look at that cat. How could you not, how could you resist that cat? Moto is a serval cat and um, Susie had to uh, foster him uh, from when, his, when he was separated from his mother as, uh, as a young kitten. And so this is really, I mean, and then look, come on, really irresistible photos, totally irresistible photos, but you do see Moto grow up throughout the course of it, and it really is the story of how of how um, Susie had to uh, help Moto become independent and release him into the wild. So um, it's a lovely metaphor for being a parent, um, but it is also full of Susie's fabulous, fabulous photographs, and it is such a wonderful personal story. The Book of Languages. Uh, so this is a really cool book that takes a look and gives kids an understanding of how languages are structured. So one of the things I'm gonna show you is that there are language families um, that, uh, so many languages are obviously related to, uh, to each other. And so this kind of gives you the sources of the families and there's like a family or language family tree. Um, and then what you get is each language and there, and there are, I think 26 languages in here. There's a two page spread and it shows you all kinds of things. So it's like a, the, you can dip in and out of different languages. You learn, you can learn certain phrases, you understand how greetings are done, you understand what the language is, where it's spoken around the world. So it's this lovely introduction to languages around the world. And it also at the end includes 
nonverbal languages. So things like semaphore, Morse code, uh, sign language, etc. So this is it's a really um, super introduction to language and the idea of language around the world. And then we have Clara Humble and the Kitten Caboodle in paperback, which accompanies Clara Humble Quiz Whiz and Clara Humble and the Not So Superpowers. So this is a trilogy um, <clears throat> by um, uh, Anna Humphrey and illustrated by Lisa Sinar. And Clara, it's a middle grade series, and Clara is this really great independent smart girl character um, and she has a best friend Bradley and um, Clara and Bradley get into a lot of trouble in each of the books. Um, in this one it involves a cat that is pregnant and a whole bunch of kittens um, and but one of the things I, I love about this series besides the fact that um, that uh, Clara is this really strong character is that the kids solve their own problems. There's no adult kind of swooping in and fixing things for them. They solve their, their old, own problems. And one of the things, I happened to be in the office and one of the things that I did was I opened up a box today and just look at this, this is super cool. This is a Turkish edition of the book that just arrived, like it's super cool. We do that kind of thing. We sell our and try to license our books around the world. Um, and so that was kind of fun because since I was presenting these books today. That is it for our paperbacks. I'm going to pass it back to Emma. Thank you so much, Judy. Oh, so many exciting books this season. Um, so this essentially concludes our, uh, our, our fall 2020 uh, event. Um, I really appreciate everyone who came out, both creators um, and just other audience members interested in our books. Um, I'm, I'm so uh, like pleasantly surprised by how many of you came. Um, and also, uh, I'm, I'm just really happy that uh, we have so many amazing books to talk about and that everyone in our staff got a chance to check out some of the books that uh, we published this season. I know everyone's from different kind of aspects of Owl Kids, but it's nice to get everyone together to, to kind of talk about books. Um, so before I go, I do have an announcement. Um, there is another exciting event coming up in October, um, not run by us, but we are uh, attending called the SLJ Day of Dialogue um, Fall Virtual Event, which is happening on October 15th. Um, so we will be attending in a special virtual booth. Um, if you would like to register for this event, I'm going to put the link in the chat here. Uh, register, attend the event on October 15th. You can visit um, our booth, a bunch of other publishers' booths. We are going to be doing some great talks with some creators, Sandra Dumay, who is here, uh, Tao Lam, who I think is also in this event right now, um, and James Gladstone. Uh, we'll all be there talking about new books. Um, our publisher, Karen Borsma, will be talking about Backlist, about some of these titles, and about what's coming in spring 2021, so you get a great sneak peek of that. We're also doing a giveaway, and uh, Tao Lam is doing another special panel. Um, about, I think it's inclusive reading. Um, so tons of fun stuff, um, tons of resources as well in our booth. So definitely register, uh, come hang out with us. We'll all be in the chat uh, that day. So you can also talk to us in real time, which is amazing. So I definitely recommend attending that. Um, and also if anyone has any questions, um, I'll, I'll leave like 30 seconds here for anyone to put any questions in the chat if they have anything to say. Um, but other than that, yeah, this, this concludes our event. It was so fantastic to see all of you here. Thank you to all of the Alkid staff who uh, came out and talked about books. Um, and yeah, I hope that you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you so much. <laughs>